Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. On the third day of creation, God created vegetation, plants, and fruit trees. Even the grapevine would be would be included in this list and was created on the third day. Wine is made from grapes. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and Jesus turned water into wine. He did not need a grapes or a wine press. It was a miracle. But another miracle happened on the third day. When we hear that phrase, the third day, we cannot but think about the resurrection of our Lord. When Jesus overcame our enemy, death, and Jesus rose from the dead. In Christ, he gives you victory over death. In Christ, he gives you the gift of eternal life. On the sixth day of creation, a wedding took place in the Garden of Eden. God united Adam and Eve as husband and wife and blessed them. God instituted marriage a lifelong union between one man and one woman. He created it for the mutual companionship of one another, for physical delight, and for the procreation of children. There was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. We don't know the couple's name. It doesn't matter, because really the text is not about the couple. Rather, the text is about Jesus. And this miracle has revealed Jesus to be the promised Savior, both God and man, that he is the true bridegroom who has come to unite himself with his bride, the church. A wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. It did not take place in Jerusalem or at the temple or in Rome. Cana of Galilee is up in the north where Jews cross-breeded with the Assyrians and were despised by Jews. It was a lowly place to be sure, but even though the people of Cana and Galilee walked in darkness, they have seen a great light, and that light is Jesus, who through this miracle has again revealed himself as the promised savior. The mother of Jesus was invited to a wedding. Uh, Jesus was there along with some of his disciples. His ministry has just begun. And all of a sudden, they ran out of wine. This was a serious matter back then, so much so that Mary was concerned about it. And she had a simple prayer to Jesus. She said to him, they, they have no wine. She simply uh, put the situation into his hands. She didn't tell him what to do. She just informed him of the situation. It's kind of like when we go through bad days, we just have a, a simple prayer. Lord, have mercy. Or, Lord, a friend is in the hospital. Please help him. Or, Lord, these are stressful times in the family. Please help. It is wrong for us to try and solve our own problems on our own. It's wrong for us to pray only as a last resort. Rather, pray a simple prayer to God. Pray often, morning and evening, especially in times of trouble. God hears our prayers, He cares. And he will answer them in the best possible way. While well, Jesus' response to his mother was kind of seems, it appears to be kind of snippy or rude, but it is not. He says to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. He doesn't address her as Mary or mother. He calls her woman. And it's a title of respect and dignity back then. The next time Jesus addresses Mary in the Gospel of John is there at the foot of the cross. And he entrusts her to the care of John. He said, woman, 
behold your son. Now, God-fearing women today, whether a wife, a mother, a teacher, or a sister in Christ, are to be respected, protected, and cared for, and spoken well of. They are valuable to marriage, family, to church, and to society. There are many faithful women who serve here in God's kingdom. Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. Now the hour to perform a miracle is coming up shortly. Jesus will turn water into wine. But the greatest hour, the hour of his glory, will be the hour of his crucifixion. On the cross, the Lamb of God dies for your sins. On the cross, Jesus sheds his blood for you as payment for your sin. On the cross, Jesus has endured the winepress of God's anger and wrath against sin. On the cross, Jesus was poured out for your transgressions and was bruised for your iniquity. The hour of crucifixion has come. And while Jesus was on the cross, Mary is there at the foot of the cross seeing watching her son suffer crucifixion and death. Jesus came into this world to save us from sin, death, and the devil. That's why he came into this world. Jesus did not come merely and only to be a miracle worker, solving problems at weddings and giving sight to the blind and raising the dead. Jesus did not come to give you financial security, perfect health, and problem-free life. Rather, he came to take all of your sins upon himself and to go to the cross and bring you life and salvation and the forgiveness of sins. The miracle of changing water to wine was easy, easy for Jesus, as all the miracles did. He just spoke the word, performed a miracle from a distance, but his sacrificial death upon the cross was hard. He suffered the scourging, the mocking, and death by crucifixion. He did it out of love and care for you. Our epistle lesson from Ephesians chapter 5 says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The giving of himself is in reference to his death upon the cross. The cross defines God's love for you in Christ Jesus. Well, at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, Mary was confident that Jesus will do something. And he, she told the servants, do whatever he tells you. In other words, Mary knows that whatever Jesus will do is best. She basically said to the servants, whatever is Jesus' will to do, Mary trusts that Jesus knows best. It's kind of like when we pray, thy will be done. We know that God knows what is best for us. It's easy for us to worry about discerning God's precise will in daily decisions when matters like that are given freedom. It's also easy for us to demand that God answer our prayers in the exact manner in which we ask it and on, on, on our own timetable. We ask, for God, we ask God for those things which we need, which is no problem, and it's, it's good and important for us to do that. It, but it is also good that we pray, thy will be done. In other words, we will trust that God knows best. Furthermore, when we go through good days or bad days, we will trust in him and in his many promises that he loves us and cares for us. This morning, Jesus says, take, eat, take, drink. 
and we will do whatever he tells us with faith, trusting in his words for us and for our salvation. It is his will that we eat and drink and partake in Holy Communion. There are six stone jar, water jars at the feast, which contained about 150 to 180 gallons. And they were for the Jewish rites of purification. And Jesus said, fill the jars to the rim. And so the servants filled the jars to the rim. After all, Mary did say, do whatever he tells you. And so they uh, listened to what she said and to what Jesus said, and they filled them with water. Then he said, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And a miracle happened. Water turned into wine instantly. He didn't have to go through the whole fermentation process. In an instant, Jesus caused water to turn into wine, his very first miracle. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, he called the bridegroom and said, Everyone serves a good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. I did a search for wine. And there's a big old long list. You can do it yourself too as well. <laughs> then I searched for the best wine. And there's a long list, some names I couldn't even pronounce or didn't even recognize. But even today, there is um, some good wine, cheap wine, and also bad wine. But what made the wine at the Canaan Galilee good was it came from Jesus. On the sixth day of creation, God said that everything was very good. And the wine here in the Canaan of Galilee was good because it's a gift from Jesus. And Jesus died on a day that we call good. And God is the giver of all, God is the giver of all good gifts. And we receive them with thanksgiving. We are thankful for them. The master said, you have kept the good wine until now. In other words, you kept the best for last. There are a lot of good things during Jesus' three years of ministry, but the best part was the last, his cross and resurrection. John chapter 1 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Someone greater than Moses is now here, and that is Jesus. The law is important and it's good for us. It reveals God's will. And as a forgiven sinner in Christ, we delight in with uh, loving God and the neighbor. But the best part is that grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ, the very gospel itself. Gone are the Old Testament regulations for purification. There is something greater Namely, holy baptism. For during your baptism, you are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You are cleansed with a washing of water in the word. You are now without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You are holy and without blemish. And you are covered with a robe of Christ's righteousness. Gone is the stone temple. There is something greater, namely Jesus, who is our temple, who dwells among us. And our hearts are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Gone are the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. And there is something greater, and namely the Passover lamb, Jesus himself, who gives you his body and blood by means of bread and wine. The wedding of Canaan in Galilee, Jesus was a guest. But here at the altar, Jesus is a host, and we are the guest, his guests, and in this meal, there is wine along with our Lord's precious blood poured out for the forgiveness of all our sin. The celebration of the Lord's Supper far exceeds any celebration there at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Here, it is a foretaste of the heavenly banquet to come in the future. In heaven, Christ the bridegroom 
will sit down with his bride in a heavenly banquet. The book of Revelation says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage feast of the Lamb has come. As a believer in Christ, you are united to Christ the bridegroom whose love for you will never fail. It will never run out. In your baptism, he washed you with water and the word, and you are covered with a beautiful garment, Christ's righteousness. Don't be like the five foolish virgins who were unprepared when the bridegroom came. Rather, be found in repentance and faith in Christ. Don't be like the man who tried to get into the wedding banquet without the garment. He was cast out. Rather, remain clothed in the robe of Christ's righteousness. Hear his word and preaching and receive his sacrament. Turning water into wine was a, a wonderful miracle. But there's one more miracle mentioned in our text for today. Verse 11 reads, This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Canaan, Galilee, and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And his disciples believed in him. Believe that Jesus is their one and only Savior and Redeemer. That he is God in human flesh. That he is the bridegroom. Near the end of John's gospel, uh, he writes... And truly, Jesus did many other miracles, many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Scripture is written so that you, you, you may believe that Jesus is your one and only Savior, that Jesus is is the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Faith in Christ is a gift given to you. It's a miracle, not by your own doing, a miracle that we are all thankful for. And your faith in Christ is then nurtured as you hear the word of God, as you receive the gospel, and you partake in Holy Communion. At the wedding of Canaan and Galilee, on the cross, and even today, Christ manifests his glory and his presence among us for the sake of saving faith in Christ. Jesus is the bridegroom. He loves his church. He cares for her. He will always be there for her, and you can trust in Jesus. He will always care for you. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus in the life everlasting. Amen.